Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Mr. John DeChristopher, who was the former VP at Zildjian. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Bart. It's nice to be here. Yeah, you've been on my list for a long time, and um, I've I've actually had a few recommendations uh, to get you on for a while. So right off the bat, I want to thank um, Dan Garza, who did the great P- uh, Peisty episode on the show. Um, so thank you to Dan and Richard Hirsch as well, who who sends me some awesome emails and we talk. So um, and I'm sure other people have recommended you. But uh, all right, so this is a cool one because. Uh, it's kind of a different topic than usual. It's it's I, I just when I thought about you, I thought this is an industry guy who has been um, I mean, you were with Zildjian for a long time um, and you 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 left in 2013. But that industry experience has given you a lot of knowledge on how things work, how these different roles in the drum industry kind of fit together. And um, that's why I wanted to, to talk to you about maybe you can let us uh outsiders have a little more information on on how things work and what the roles are and people working at factories and companies and importing and exporting and just all this uh kind of stuff which i'm sure you've had your fingers in and i don't expect you to be an expert on uh you know every single (laughs) detail (laughs) but um yeah so why don't we jump in here and let's talk about maybe your roles that you've had, I'm sure maybe there's been more than just, you're usually not uh, day one starting as vice president of a giant company. (laughs) So maybe some of the things and the roles that you've had over the years with Zildjian or any other companies, and then we'll go from there and fill in some other roles. Sure. Absolutely. Well, I I did get my start uh, in the industry side of it in uh, 1985, working for Simmons Electronic Drums. And um, I was 24 at the time. I was, I'd been working in drum retail and that sort of gave me a, you know, a sort of, uh, you know, got my foot in the door, so to speak, with, with knowing the person that was running Simmons in California. Um, and my background at that time was in sales, you know, coming from retail, I was hired at Simmons initially. Um, I worked in artist relations. I did some customer service and some other things. And then eventually, uh, Glenn Thomas, who was running Simmons in California, moved me over to sales because he said, you know, this is, this is where you're, you know, where I need you and where you're going to do the best job. And, uh, you know, and I can compensate you better, you know, in this position. So yeah, I did that for about a year and three or four months from the summer of 1985 until the fall of 86. Um, and I'll just sort of give you the brief sort of sure. background here. Um, I was approached by Don Lombardi president of drum workshop, uh, in this, in the fall of 1986 to work for him leading up to the introduction, the official introduction of DW drums, which was January, 1987. So Don called me, I'd I'd met him a few times out in LA at various events and, and we were, you know, friendly and he got my phone number from someone and called and said, I'm looking for someone who can wear a couple of different hats, um, you know, sales, artist relations. We really want to make a push uh, in January to really sort of be an official drum company, American drum company. And uh, after a couple of meetings with Don, I accepted the position and I started working there. And, uh, and, and so that I did that uh, out in California until early 1989, when I was approached by Zildjian uh, to work for them, I'd actually moved back to Boston late in 1988, but I was still working for DW and, uh, and that sort of, uh, you know, invitation or that, uh, you know, Zildjian approaching me at the NAMM show in 1989 led to me working there a couple of months later where I worked for 24 years, as you say. Um, and so when I was hired at Zildjian, they, they wanted to hire me strictly as an artist relations manager and promotions manager. That was there at Lenny Demuzio, who had been there for many, many years at that point was moving to education and they wanted someone who was, a. by that time, you know, I'd been in the industry almost four years. I was a known commodity to a lot of these artists and they wanted someone who could sort of walk in on day one and, and know the job pretty well. Yeah. Little did they know that, you know, I had them fooled because <laughs> <laughs> so that's all part of it though, is just kind of being in the right place. And, and, uh, I'm yeah. sure you were very knowledgeable, but faking it till you make it kind of thing in a, in a way. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, a, you know, the, the thing, the, what I remember most about that was, you know, as, as much as I felt like I knew some things, um, 
I certainly learned a lot right from the beginning, you know, when I, when I went to work at Zildjian and, and, uh, and it was a situation where they just, uh, you know, I sort of hit the ground running. I can't explain it any better than that. I just yeah. remember my first day there just, you know, okay, here's the phone, here's your desk, here's your office go, you know, and, uh, and, and that was that. And within a few months of working at Zildjian talking about different roles, I, um, the company Zildjian had bought a drumstick factory in late 1988 or 89 in Alabama. And, and we were getting very serious about being a drumstick company at that point. And Armin Zildjian himself said to me, I want you to be the guy running our drumstick business. Mm. Uh, not, not the actual factory, not the manufacturing part of it, but the, the marketing, the product management, et cetera. Sure in addition to artist relations. So that became uh, a big part of my job for a long time, which was the, the management of, of, um, you know, production and making sure we had enough bread and butter models like five A's and five B's. Now that we were making them our, ourselves at the factory in Alabama, um, but also to design some sticks because we just had a, a very basic offering of just generic models and and that was the beginning of the signature stick idea that you know sort of concept for Zildjian, which we were kind of the newest player in that game. Vic Firth was al- already well established with many uh, signature drumsticks. Promark, uh, Regal Tip was still a big player in those days. And Vader, of course, um, was was there. They were they weren't doing signature sticks yet, but they were starting to grow as a as their own brand. They had been making our sticks and other people's sticks before that. Mm-hmm. So, um, so the first artist that I signed was Tony Williams. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that was in 1990. He was the first Zildjian signature stick artist. And then, you know, many others came after that. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I will say largely due to Tony's influence, like Dennis Chambers and Vinnie Kaliuta and, and, uh, a handful of guys, you could, you could almost draw a line directly from the fact that Tony, was sure. the first guy yeah you once you get the first one it's like with uh podcasts and and you know stuff on youtube once you get a big guest you start to get bigger guests and it's yeah, like anything yeah. um that's awesome you must zildjian must have been happy to land that you know yeah they were they were it was you know it was an exciting time because the 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 drumstick brand could only go up at that point. I mean, it was, you know, we kind of went from, from zero to, I won't say zero to 60, but we went zero to 35, you know, pretty quickly. And, uh, and things were starting to happen and the quality was getting better. And, and uh, I also was responsible for some sticks. I think they, some models, they still sell today, mm-hmm. which were the super five B and the six a and the Z four a and uh, later like the super five a and some other, um, you know, good selling, yeah, popular sticks. Yeah, Zildjian sticks are great. I mean, I've used them for years. Uh, they're not like just a white label kind of like Zildjian's written on it kind of thing. I mean, they are very well made, um, great sticks that are that are up there with any other brand for sure. Absolutely, yeah. They, you know, and I think the fact that when the company um, when Zildjian bought Vic Firth in 2010 and was able to you know, uh, integrate their manufacturing into, into Zildjian drumsticks. I think that was a big game changer for them too. And, um, I don't think it's a secret, but prior to Zildjian buying Vic Firth, they were actually making our sticks for us for the yeah. a few years before that. And, um, and that, and that really improved the quality and then it just really, things just really came together. So, yeah, for um, sure. I'll, I'll just, I'll just add one quick thing too, Bart. To totally. the, I'm, so I, I, in around 1990, Six, we hired a, a guy named John Sorensen. The drumstick brand had grown to the point where I had to make a decision as to whether I wanted to spend all my time on that. It needed a full-time person now. I couldn't be doing artist relations and traveling and doing all the things I was doing with that side of it and still really effectively manage the drumstick business. So we hired a really good marketing guy named John Sorensen who worked there for a long time as the drumstick product manager Mm. and did a fabulous job. But I was just going to say that one of the most rewarding things during my time at Zildjian is just before I left the company, 
um, I'd been working for two years to get Ringo Starr to play our sticks. <laughs> Man. And it was literally the day that I announced that I was leaving the company that Ringo's contract showed up in the mail and <laughs> signed. Yeah. So it was, it was did it. a pretty, yeah, it was a pretty huge deal. And I'll tell you, I was sort of holding out. I didn't want to leave that piece of unfinished business. Yeah. I had given my resignation, so to speak. And I said, I'm going to wait, you know, I'll stay a couple of months, help with the transition if you're going to bring somebody in. And, but at the very least, I said, there are a few things I, I, I don't want to leave undone. And that was one of them. So, that wow. Was, that must yeah. have felt good just being like, I did it. You don't want it to be like, uh, I feel like that's almost kind of like in politics that happens where you've worked on something for four years and then six months later, something, you know, the next guy gets the credit. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, I, you know, I mean, I, I not, not to I, by any means, uh, you know, sound full of myself, but I was kind of afraid that if I was dealing with Ringo's manager, that if, if he found yeah. out I wasn't there anymore, he might back out. Of Absolutely. The he might say, you know what? I, I think we're going to stay where we are. Yeah. On this. And, uh, there was a level of comfort with me sure. there with, with those guys. So I was yeah. happy that happened. So how did you then go from that to vice president or was there something in between there? Um, yeah, it was a few years in between and, and, you know, all, all that time, um, I'd been promoted from, uh, artist relations manager to director of artist relations. And I, I did, you know, I, I held that position for many years and during all that time, you know, I, things were as the company continued to grow um i was more involved with getting artists involved with product designs and um you know just really nurturing the program trying sure. to find the best artists to represent the company um getting more involved with education we we started a a, a program with berkeley and artist in residence mm annual sort of uh, bringing an artist in for a week at Berkeley. And I was the sort of conduit to making that happen with Berkeley. I'd, I'd get together, go and have lunch with the president and maybe the, the chair of percussion at Berkeley. And we'd settle on a couple of guys to target and it might be Peter Erskine. It might be Simon Phillips. It might be um, Dennis Chambers or somebody like that. And, and uh, you know, I mean, things like that were, were th things that I was, doing to sort of make my position as artist relations director and ultimately vice president, like growing that position and, and, uh, and, and finding ways kind of more innovative ways to have the artist be a bigger part of the company, you know, utilizing yeah. them as best we could. Which um, I mean, in Zildjian's case or any other brand like that, I mean, the artist, like you said, make them more of the company. I mean, f outwardly facing, they are the company. I mean, really you think yeah. about, the people who are playing these symbols, it's like, that's the face of your brand. And if you're not getting new artists and things like that. So, I mean, it, it's just so apparent and clear that you really care about what you were doing at that time it, for each position. I'm sure you cared just as much about selling versus the sticks versus artist relations. I mean, that's, that's just most important is actually caring. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and, and just to give you an example, we, um, in 1998, we, we had the first, um, what we called then the American Drummers Achievement Awards, later named the Zildjian Drummers Achievement Awards. And we honored uh, Elvin Jones and Max Roach and Louis Belson and Roy Haynes. And, and that was a fabulous event. And it was at Berkeley. And we had um, Peter Erskine, Steve Gadd, Terry Lynn Carrington, and Marvin Smitty Smith all pay tribute to all these you know, iconic drummers. And then five years later, they, they coincided with anniversary years for Zildjian. So mm -hmm. five years later, 2003, uh, we honored Steve Gadd and Armin Zildjian had passed away six months before mm. or, you know, prior to that. So we, sure. we honored Armin Zildjian and I was put in charge of sort of producing the whole show, so to speak. And that was a major undertaking. And, and that was what ultimately got me promoted to vice president. I figured it's either going to kill me, get me fired, or I'll get a big promotion out of it. So yeah, it worked out. You, <laughs> it yeah. worked out. It almost killed me. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I don't think I came close to being fired, but it, yeah. it, uh, it was, it was a great event. And, and in so doing, I mean, what I, I'd, I'd known Steve for a number of years before that, and we'd become very, very good friends, but you know, something like that, we were in such close contact leading up to it. And we, you know, we got the James Taylor band basically to play there. And James himself came and paid tribute and cool. Paul Simon. 
so it really bonded Steve and I in a, in a way that, you know, 20 years later now we're, you know, as close as ever. And, um, and so my point being that, you know, that was another way of, of, um, you know, really making the most of these relationships with these artists. Uh, it was a great way to pay tribute to Steve. And then what that led to was designing some symbols based around Steve, the, you know, the session series, which was kind of based on Steve's symbol sound. And after that, we did these mission from GAD tours, which, mm. um, you know, it, it may be hard to believe for some people, but I actually had to talk Steve into doing these clinics. I mean, he was someone that was, uh, had, had done them before, but was always so busy with touring yeah. with Eric Clapton or, or James Taylor or anybody. And, uh, and I remember him coming to the NAMM show in January and in, in 2005. And we had a reception in one of the suites where we brought all our dealers. And I said, Steve, just come with me and meet some of these guys. These, these are all the drum shop owners, the five-star drum shop owners that, that want to have you. And, and he got such a great feeling for meeting all these guys that a week or two later, he agreed to doing the tour because he was still like, well, you know, I only have this little window, you know, of a couple of weeks off between what I'm doing here and what I'm doing there. And I, yeah. you know, I love to be home. And I said, Steve, come on, we'll have a great time. And then we got this idea of using a tour bus. And oh, so, it was, cool. you know, it was, yeah. And then, you know, he was sort of hooked after that. He <laughs> couldn't wait to do the next one, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Oh my God. So, so that really, I mean, building these relationships, it seems so important, obviously as, as you know, dealing with artists, but they have to like you. I mean, that's seems very yeah. important. You have to yeah. be personable and not, uh, you have to be transparent with them and, and, and just a, not a, not just schmoozing all the time. It seems like you really yeah. genuinely have, have built some friendships that have followed through after your time there, um, which that's just, it doesn't get better than that. Well, I thank you. And, and, and I think you, you hit the nail on the head when you said be transparent, because when people ask me, um, you know, like what, what's sort of advice can you give someone who's just getting into the business? And, um, and I, and I think what you just said is so important at being honest, I mm -hmm. think being yourself, obviously, but I think most importantly, you, you, the worst thing you could ever do is, um, you know, just sort of be dishonest or, or um, yeah. not be transparent with someone. It will always come back to bite you. And even, even when the news isn't good, and I try to tell people this, and I used to try to impart that on the people that work for me, is that, you know, it's, it's anybody can do this job if it's just saying yes all day. Yeah. Any, anybody, there's, there's no magic to that. Um, but to be able to, you know, what you have to do sometimes say no and still have that person respect you and, and understand why and not want to run off and go to another company. I mean, that's, that's the key to that. You have to, you have to be able to manage all those different things and manage people's expectations. Yeah. And I mean, you, what you said is exactly right. I mean, I, I, even on my kind of like, you know, I'm not really in the drum industry, I guess kind of, I am with the podcast, but I, I've talked to a lot of industry people and there's always some little thing where you have an opportunity to kind of like, I, I don't know, the word spreads in the drum yes. world very fast, good and bad. And just like, uh, every little tiny thing you do does, uh, cause, you know, a ripple somewhere where you just want to be honest. And that I think spreads of, oh, he's a great guy or, oh, I don't know about that guy. Be careful it, that or girl <laughs> that, that spreads and, uh, yeah. is, is really your reputation. Um, you're always kind of working on, uh, growing it and making it better. So I think, um, and that's not just the drum community, that's life. You know, if you're, you just got to always be honest and upfront, which clearly you, you are, and it's paid off, um, in your career. So, well, I, uh, thank you. I appreciate that. And I, and I, I agree completely that that's, that's the key to it. And I, you know, as an example for me, it's kind of interesting now that, um, you know, I, I knew a lot, I know a lot of drummers that weren't Zildjian artists just from, you know, seeing them at NAMM shows, just sort of knowing them. And, uh, y you know, I have this show of my own life for my drum room. And I've had a number of non-Zildjian artists that I really didn't know well, 
Um, but, but they knew me and they, and they, Liberty DeVito, for example, who I've, you know, I've sort of, we've known peripherally for some years each other, but not well. Um, Joe Vitale, who's a big hero of mine, you know, again, not a Zildjian guy, but uh, just a number of these guys that when I reached out and said, I'd love to have you do this, they're like, yeah, yeah, I'd love to do it, you know? And yeah. um, I think if, if they had a, any sort of a vibe that I wasn't a straight shooter or whatever the case may be, they, they certainly didn't have to agree to be on my show. And so I, you know, I, I appreciated that, um, yeah. you know, they had a good feeling about it. For sure. And I, I should have mentioned that earlier, live from my drum room, your show is just unbelievable and has a number of guests and it's on YouTube and as a, a, a podcast as well, the audio format. And I'll share the link to that. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about that more kind of towards the sure. end as we, as we plug that stuff. But, um, all right. So what I'd love to do now is kind of like even jumping off of your career, kind of rewind a little bit and maybe look at some of these positions, not not really just as as you at, at you know, let's say Simmons or at DW, but but like in general, um, let's maybe start with sales. Like what does a salesman do? Um, and let's, I guess, say in the in 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 more modern times, as opposed to like in the eighties, I'm sure things really changed when you're selling, uh, electric drums from Simmons in the mid eighties, <laughs> which <laughs> was like the prime, the prime of yeah. that. But we were just writing orders back then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what does a salesperson do at a drum company? Obviously I know they sell, but you know what I mean? Like a little bit more, how does that actually sure. look? I used to spend a lot of time, uh, on the road with sales reps because I was, I'd be out with a clinician and, you know, doing clinic tours for two weeks at a time. So I got to know a lot of the reps really well. And, uh, and, you know, I, Zildjian had and still has some really great professional sales reps and it's a hard job because it's become more and more competitive, but, you know, I would see the reps to give you an example when they, when they pay a sales call to a dealer, they're in there doing an inventory The the, the, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn and I, if I'm giving wrong information, please correct me. Any sales rep that <laughs> happens to hear this, but, but you know, the, the, the dealer sort of expects the Zildjian rep, the Peisty rep, the Sabian rep, whoever, Mino rep to come in and manage their inventory, so to speak, kind of mm. come in and say, okay, I've, I've done a physical inventory. And I think a lot of these guys have it computerized too, but, um, but they'll come in and they'll, they'll look at what's, in stock, what's been selling, you know, I, you, you had X number of these on the last order and they're all gone. So I think you need to go heavier with this one and, you know, and hopefully buy more of these other yeah. ones, but if they're not selling as quick. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a definitely a, a challenging job, especially nowadays too, where um, there's so many brands out there. Now, when I, when I started at Zildjian even in 1989, it was basically really just three symbol brands. I mean, mm -hmm. Meinl was was out there, but they weren't what they are today. Sure. And it was Zildjian, Sabian, Peisty. And you had X amount of floor space. And I know you know how this works, Bart. You've been in enough drum shops mm -hmm. to see this. It's They have X, X amount of shelf space, floor space. And, you know, there's only so many brands that they can fit and only so many SKUs per brand that they'll have room for. So that was always the sort of battle with, with the sales reps was, you know, they, they want to have the biggest, they want Zildjian to have the biggest footprint. If it's the Zildjian sales rep, he's coming in saying, well, you're selling more of my stuff. So I need more space. Yeah. Um, but of course the other companies are coming in saying, well, you know, but we want space too. And um, so it, yeah. it's, I, I don't know if that gives you a good idea. Of no, it absolutely does. And then I imagine people have territories that they work and they build relationships with those shop owners, uh, different exactly. drum shops and which again, so you want salespeople who people like to talk to. You don't want some, you know, guy who's not representing your brand. Well, obviously. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're exactly. And, and, and a good sales rep, and I've seen this, I've experienced it firsthand is going to advocate for their dealers. Yeah. And they're going to they're going to sort of push back at the company at times when they have to. And mm. and if they feel um for whatever reason that you know the credit terms aren't right for the dealer, they're going to they're going to stand up and fight for that dealer. They're going to say, "Look, I know he, he can't he couldn't pay his bill in 30 days last month. 
because things were slow or whatever the situation was, but come on, you know, let's, let's give him 45 days or let's, let's not take away his credit privileges. Let's sure. not, don't go putting him on COD because he had one bad month of paying his bill. You know, I mean, it's, it's those kinds of things. And I'll say in my situation, back when clinics were a thing, they're not really a thing anymore, but you know, there was a time when I'd have the reps sort of fighting for if I was going to go out on the road with, maybe it was with Steve Gadd or maybe it was with Dennis Chambers or Keith Carlock, they'd say, hey, you have to make sure you, if, if there's only going to be 10 dates for the whole country, make sure I get a date at, you know, at Explorers Percussion. Because, mm -hmm. you know, Wes has done a great job and he's been asking and I've been promising. So I, you know, I go, okay, well, I, I know Wes. All right, yeah. let's, let's make sure we get Wes on that list, you know, and um, so that, you know, again, that's a good sales rep who's sort of looking out for his dealers and yeah, and, uh, totally. And, and just a side note, Wes is great. He was emailing me yesterday about, uh, showing me, um, a little video of kind of his, he has a little history section. He has a bunch of drum sets lining the walls that have, you know, through the, through the years of, you know, like early 1900s, here's this, here's that up through the seventies with like a Vista light, uh, Ludwig kit. So Wes is great. Um, he's a great guy. Yeah. Okay, so that's cool for sales. Now, there's just so many different little positions. Before we go, I mean, we're obviously you kind of went the um I guess the business side of things, but maybe we while we're in this um I don't know, this tier of of kind of feet on the ground, why don't we hop over and talk about actually people who are working and manufacturing things? I mean, a little bit. Obviously, we know there there's that's an, there's a whole Zildjian episode that talks about, you know, the process of making them and all this stuff, but there's right. a lot of people who are actually making drumsticks and factory workers. And it's fair to say a lot of them aren't drummers, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So how does that work? Do people like, is it, let's just say in Zildjian's case or any, anyone's case, is it kind of just answering an ad like you would for any factory job and going and getting the job? I mean, is there any info on about, you know, kind of that lane? That's a, that's a good question. I mean, I think to some degree, certainly when I was there, you know, when there were openings for positions in the factory, they would advertise and, uh, you know, a, a person would be trained. Did, they didn't necessarily have to be a drummer. And, and I know you did something with Paul Francis, who, mm -hmm. who is a drummer, of course. Sure. And, um, he came in there as a, as a young, you know, wide eyed, excited, enthusiastic young guy. I think he was, I want to say he was 18 or 19 yeah, when he started like working that. there. Yeah. I, I started just a couple of months after he did and he was this just exuberant kid. You know, we used to call him <laughs> young Paul Francis just because he was so, you know, just he, he wanted to soak it all up. But, yeah. Um, but, but I, but there are people that work there. Certainly at the time I was here, there were people that worked, um, you know, in the melting room or some of the different machines that were trained to work those machines, but weren't necessarily drummers, but they understood that the end result was to make a great sounding product. So, uh, instrument and whether it's lathing a symbol so that it weighs this much and mm -hmm. you put it on the scale, you know, and understanding the importance of that and it can't be too heavy or it can't be too light. And, um, yeah, you know, it, but I think, I, I think my feeling, and maybe this is what you're getting at. I think to some degree though, being a drummer when you when you're making something that's drum related is certainly uh, i i think a um a benefit yeah. you know i think people making drumsticks that are drummers that can actually you know feel how only a drummer can understand how a drumstick feels in their hand a, yeah. a sort of regular person is going to go well it feels like a stick to me you know yeah no that makes perfect sense yeah and i think of ludwig who has i know there's there's a some older ladies who work there that they they talk about and post pictures of and and it's just uh yeah but you think of any factory job and there's a lot of people who work in, you know, factory situations who make things that literally have nothing to do with their everyday life. They just are punching metal slap, whatever they're doing. They're, yeah, they're sure. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Now, I guess, so maybe we hop over and I, I'm really interested too in the artist relations side of things, um, which you've talked about a lot, but I think just maybe we dig a little deeper in that and. I mean, how does that really look? Are you on the phone every day with your artists? Are they calling you from the road if there's a problem? I mean, what would a typical day in the life of an artist relations, you know, like not maybe not the manager of everything, but just kind of the, you know, the artist relations team? How, how does that look? Well, for a long time, um, it was 
you were on the phone almost every minute of every day. I mean, yeah. and I say it for a long time until we started emailing and text messaging and things like that. But I'm, I'm, you know, I go back to the analog days. Sure. And, um, when I started there in 89, I didn't have, I had, there was, there was a, uh, a really nice woman that was sort of the, uh, assistant administrative assistant for the entire marketing department. So she worked directly for my boss but also sort of assisted me would screen my calls and take messages for me and things like that. But, um, but she wasn't really an artist relations in that capacity in mm-hmm. that, in that function. Like she would take an or she would take a message and say, uh, Anton Fig called and needs this symbol, um, asked if you could pick one out for him and send it to him. So then that would just be the message. I would then of course take it from there, you know, yeah. but, um, but to give you an example, for a number of years, it would be people, drum techs, drummers themselves, uh, potential artists, you know, people wanting to be signed with the company would call. And, uh, and I'll be honest, I mean, in many cases, those would have to be the lower priority type calls to take. If I'm on the phone with Kenny Aronoff yeah. or Peter Erskine and somebody beeps in and says, uh, you know, Bart's on the phone and he wants to talk to you about, he wants, he's going to send you his package, but wants to, I say, well, can you take a message and I'll get back to him or please have him send his package. And, sure. you know, I, I learned pretty quickly, Bart, that, that I could spend an entire day just fielding those calls. And, and yeah. if you took every one of those calls, you could be on the phone for a half hour as the guy or gal sort of pitches their, their gig. And, and, you know, I'd say, send me, send me something to look at so I can listen to it and read it and see what you're doing. You know, I mean that that's a whole, everyone has been on the other end of that where you're like, you're sending something, especially even young people who have no chance to be like signed up, but, but you can't blame people for being for the, the, the drive to want to be connected to the brands they love. But in reality, again, if you're on the phone with Peter Erskine, you're talking to the biggest drummers in the world a young drummer in let's say Cincinnati where I am it's like it's not even I mean did that get I don't I'm sure you're such a nice guy you're not going to say it got annoying but it had to get a little um I don't know just kind of like old f- fielding these yeah yeah it and I'll, I can say it now it, it was annoying at a point <laughs> <laughs> it, I mean it, you know how could it not be yeah. in that um you know again there's only so much time in the day and I will say that when I started working there, I, I've, I've told this story before, but I started in the springtime in May. And not long after I'd been there, a month or two, the, the sort of concert season started. And in those days, there was a, uh, it's still there, there's a shed called, um, I think it's called Xfinity Center. But anyway, it was, it was about 30 miles away and bands were playing there every night of the week. And in most cases, they were artists that I had to go see. So I'd be leaving the office at 4.30 or 5 with some swag, you know, some t-shirts and a couple of replacement symbols and heading to the shed. And I'd be there and I'd stay for the show and see the guy afterward and then get home at, you know, midnight and then rinse, repeat, you know, go back to work the next day. And, and, you know, it was, it was really tough. And I know you have kids. I, my, at that time, my son was two years old and my daughter was soon to be born. Um, So it was a really hard time family wise for me to sort of be yeah. present and with this new job that I was excited about having, but, um, it was taking an incredible amount of my time in my life. Sure. Um, so I, 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 as best as I could tried to balance that, but it, it wasn't always easy because stuff needed to be done and yeah. we didn't have cell phones in those days. And sometimes I'd get, I, I wouldn't give my phone number out to everyone, but I'd get a call at home on a weekend from someone who, for whatever reason, felt like by calling me on a Sunday, that was going to help get them a symbol. <laughs> you know, I'd say, well, look, I'm going to be in the office tomorrow. We can, we can talk about this yeah. tomorrow. I'll get it out as fast as I can, you know, but oh man, but, um, there's wow. nothing I can do on a Sunday, but yeah, the going, like that. the going to the shows, like you said, and seeing people, I mean, and then being in the office, I mean, that's if, if you're going that late at night and then going right back in in the morning, I mean, that can be kind of brutal. I mean, that's, yeah, but yeah. that clearly you kind of throw yourself into your job like that. But, uh, you're right where if you have young kids, you kind of got to choose what, what is too much. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny too, when I think back to that too, because 
so many of my friends, you know, thought that I just had the, you know, it was a great job. I'm not saying it wasn't a great job, but they thought like, you mean you actually get paid to go to concerts? And it's like, listen, it's not, it's not what you think. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, if you want to, if you want to consider getting paid, but, but look at it this way, it's unpaid overtime. I mean, I'm, I'm at these concerts after the, you know, when the clock stops, so to speak. Yeah. So, I mean, if you really want to get technical, but, but I think, at that time, early on, a lot of my friends are like, "Wow, what a what a great kid!" You, I mean, you got to go see Fleetwood Mac last night. Wow, cool! It's like, yeah, it was it was a great show. But you know what? If I were home on the couch watching TV, I'd have been good with that too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Like, yeah, I'm tired. <laughs> it's yeah. every wow. Yeah, that's uh, that's a side where it's less glamorous. I mean, it is very glamorous, but it's less glamorous than you think. Where it's like, yeah, you're a human and you want to take a break and and go home, but. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, and, you know, you you mentioned early on sort of how artist relations and all these other jobs interact with each other. Yeah. And and, and I think a, a great example would be, you know, I was involved, for example, we do these photo shoots as part of our advertising campaign. So as the artist relations person, I would be the, again, the, the sort of liaison to getting Peter Erskine or Tony Williams or somebody for the photo shoot. And in many cases, if it was local or sometimes I'd go out to LA or San Francisco and, and, you know, be part of the photo shoot. I won't say supervise it, but Mm -hmm. certainly, um, you know, kind of give the photographer an idea of what we were looking for. And um, so, you know, it's, it was at that time anyway, it was a job that touched a lot of different things. It touched sales from the standpoint of, you know, bringing a clinician out on the road and we, we try to tie in some sort of sale at Explorers percussion with, you know, X, Y, Z drummer being there. Yeah. Um, as I said, photo shoots or just, just marketing in general, just a, you sure. know, an ad campaign that involved a bunch of different artists. This episode is brought to you by dream symbols. I want to talk a little bit about the dream symbols recycling program. The recycling program is simple. Bring your broken or unwanted symbols, all brands accepted into your local dream dealer. And you can earn $1 for every inch of symbol you bring in towards the purchase of a new dream symbol. For example, bring in two 20-inch symbols for recycling and receive $40 off the price of a new dream symbol. It's that easy. They, in turn, take the symbols recycled and use them to create new products like the ReFX Crop Circles and the Naughty Saucers. Check them out online at dreamsymbols.com and follow them on social media at Dream Symbols. Well, you just kind of help me figure out another position to maybe talk about with marketing. And the photo shoots is really interesting, too. I out of school when I was kind of getting into the world of like media stuff, I worked as a photo assistant for a while and uh, on on a lot of product shots, like three day shoot for Tempur-Pedic where I was building beds and things like that. And it's like Mm -hmm. that's also not that glamorous. Obviously, it's fun to be the photographer who comes in like the rock star and shoots them. But there's a lot of like long hours and products. Um, does do yeah. these companies typically shoot things in house? Like if if you say you need, all right, we need a picture of this eight inch a custom splash. Let's go shoot it or whatever. This this snare drum for other brands. Um, do do they have people on staff typically, like a photographer? Or? I think I think nowadays uh, probably a lot of companies do that. And and I you know I want to say this kind of delicately. I think there's not as much emphasis on shooting products as there was 20 or 30 years ago like for to to answer your question when 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 i started at zildjian we would go to a studio and we would bring the products that we were shooting to the studio to use the best lighting Mm -hmm. to use that photographer's best you know he'd he'd use whatever lenses and yeah cameras that he felt were going to be best i mean it's really hard to shoot symbols too when you think about it shiny shiny exactly when we could never do it internally without the, the reflection of the shininess, like you said, especially brilliant finish symbols. Yeah. They were always tricky. But, you know, we had great photographers and especially um, with artists, there were some artists that liked certain photographers because they just made them feel comfortable and because they used certain types of lighting. And um, Rob Shanahan is a great friend. He's an old friend of mine and a great photographer based out in LA who's shot all the stars. Yeah, And he goes on tour with Ringo and as Ringo's photographer, and, and that's like the level he's at, yeah. but he's shot everybody. And, uh, but guys like Rob are expensive because he's top of the food chain, you know, he's high quality stuff. So yeah. 
a lot of companies, I think now, are, I mean, when I was at Zildjian toward the end, we were doing a lot of that stuff in house. And honestly, I, I it showed, I, I you know, I, I never, having come from knowing what it used to look like, I was pretty critical at times of how things looked. And I wouldn't hesitate to say, this looks like, you know, poop. But, but people often don't care as much because they're looking at it on their on their phone. And if it's just a little right. thumbnail picture of a ride symbol or whatever, they don't care as much as opposed to a full setup, you know, with drums and it's this beautiful thing. It it it's I feel like even maybe post COVID, audio quality can be worse and people don't notice as much anymore because they're used to right. the zoom sound. Uh they're used to like things being a little less um I mean, photographers, like you said, are expensive. I mean, I remember working on shoots where the guy was using a like a Hasselblad camera that was just the price of a car, the price of a nice car. And it's it's yeah. just uh it's it's crazy. But yeah, it makes sense to do it in, in house and it does, especially now with um uh, you know, the fact that as you pointed out too, I mean, so much of this stuff doesn't even see the light of day on magazines anymore. Yeah. Where, where you're you're going to get the benefit of a really high quality photo with the glossiness of an ad. You're, it's going to go in a social media. It's going to go in a Facebook post or an Instagram post, and you can shoot it with the high quality iPhone. You yeah. Know? iPhones. My wife's iPhone 12 or whatever it is is like a crazy great camera. It's awesome. So, yeah. 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 Exactly. And so that leads to and and uh, you and I can both attest to this that. Uh, I feel like before I got into doing this podcast, if someone said, oh, I do social media marketing or I do social media for X brand or company, um, you know, locally or wherever, you'd kind of look at it and go like, oh, whatever. OK, <laughs> but now spending a bunch of time doing social media, it is very difficult. It is hard to do cons- be consistent. There's a lot of pressure to get likes and things. All of these brands, I imagine, have in-house social media people who post and do all this stuff. What does that look like? Is it typically one person? Is it a team? I mean, Zildjian has a ton of followers. And and again, this is kind of being Zildjian-centric because of your background. But in in general, is it is it one person or more? I, I think, I mean, when I, when I, just before I left um, Zildjian in, you know, 2012, 2013, uh, a woman, she's not doing the job. She still works there. Anne Marie Sanfilippo um, was doing that job, and she was kind of a one man band in terms of social media. But it was, it was still kind of. I mean, Facebook had been around a few years at that point, and Instagram had been around, but it was still um, kind of a new thing. So I, I don't know if they have a team of people. I, my sense is they probably have a person. Yeah, that's part of the marketing or digital marketing, whatever they might call it now. Uh, larger group of other people that do other things, but I, I don't know that it would make sense to have more than one person. Well, um, I mean, if, yeah, really, I can again. You and I can both speak to it. Of like people, I feel like your vibe comes through with the social media that we do, and it, maybe it makes more sense to have one person, mm-hmm. so someone doesn't right. write in their own a description in their voice, and it sounds completely different. So I guess it's smart to have one person to be. You know, that's a good point. Yeah, to be the, the continuity of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, all right, then uh, there's so many little things, though, too, about like, like Zildjian, for example, did a lot of they do a lot of great videos. They do all these things. So you do have to be everywhere. So it's not just doing uh, a little Facebook post here and there. But right. there's, these are whole right. these are big productions. And, and a lot of the companies do them or they have. I guess it, it's that's also blending the the artist relations too, where you get these great players to come in. Let's shoot some promo videos. Let's do this. Right. And then that goes. So that's, again, the uh, kind of um, synergy that's needed to make it all work together. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Bart, because, again, this is this is since I've been gone from the company. Um, it, well, I, I'll back up a second. Uh, a very good friend of mine who now is the vice president at Silgen, uh, Joe Testa. I don't know if you know Joe. Oh, yeah, I've spoken, uh, emailed a few times. Yeah. You have. Okay. Yeah. He worked for Yamaha for a long time. And then... Uh, worked for Vic Firth, got hired at Vic Firth as their director of artist relations. And I want to say that was 2010. And it was the later that year that Zildjian, we called it at the time, merged with Vic Firth, but Mm -hmm. basically bought Vic Firth. And so the two companies were separate for a while. I I left, as I say, in 2013, they were still somewhat independent. And then over the last few years, they've come together as one company. They've integrated as one. And Joe is now vice president of both 
Zildjian and Vic Firth. And, and I'm mentioning Joe because he has a background. He was the one that when they were separate companies, he started the Vic Firth, um, Vic Firth Live or whatever mm-hmm. it was called. It was the, and Zildjian then sort of, I yep. want to say, I won't say they piggybacked on it, but they did their own version of it. Yeah. But it was kind of, I, I want to say it was Joe's sort of idea, concept of these live videos that you're talking about. Yeah. And he had a background in that from working for, um, he worked for Sandy Feldstein's company in the early 90s, um, CPP Bellwin. And he did video editing. And uh, so he had a background in that. So he's, my point being that you're right, there's a, there's a real synergy in marriage between artist relations now and video content and the importance of having all that, you know, in social media. And, yeah. uh, and it's, that's a big part. I think, I mean, it was becoming part of my job when I go on these clinic tours to get video of drummers, get photos, log into the Zildjian Facebook page and post a picture of, Steve Gadd or Dennis Chambers, you know, and that kind of thing. And that's become even bigger now. So, I mean, that's what we keep saying it, but that's what, that's the face of it. That's what people see. That's what the, um, you know, 12 year old drummer who's watching YouTube looks at who then becomes a lifelong user of this brand and falls in love with it and, and, and just all that good stuff. So, all right. So let's, uh, I I was thinking to myself like, oh, there's, there's gotta be, you know, there's the role too of like the accounting people and there's all this stuff, but that's not as fun (laughs) to talk about obviously, but, but really there are people who literally there's numbers people. I mean, this is businesses that have to function. Uh, and that is obviously a part of the company, you know? Absolutely. No. And that's another really excellent point because, um, you can't operate a company effectively, efficiently, for any period of time, unless you are aware of the numbers, unless you're, you know, you're cognizant of, of maintaining a profit and, and, you know, running a business properly. And, and so I was, I think I, I think I, hopefully they, the accountants at Zildjian will look back fondly at me, but I was certainly, um, uh, you know, I, I, I had to, I had to advocate for artists. I had to advocate for my department and what I wanted to do. And we were definitely at odds at times. Yeah. Um, I, with uh, maybe the CFO coming and saying, you know, we, we need to, we need to find some money and we, you know, and, and the budgets and I'm asking all the department heads to, to, um, cut X amount of dollars or can you reduce your budget by this much? And, Sometimes I could do that. And other times I'd say, look, I, I'm going to need this to, to do all these things that I'm planning to do. And we, and we need to do these things. It's not, um, you know, yeah. they're, they're going to make sense. They're going to be important to the company. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, there's, there's a responsibility. And, and I think more to your point, I think as, as any good artist relations person understands, you are, you do work for a company, you advocate for the drummers, but you, you, you do have to be, um, you know, responsible for your job and, and, and not, uh, spend more than you've been budgeted and yeah. Overextend yourself. Yeah, absolutely. You can, you can push it a little bit and take a risk and it pays off and it did great. And that's awesome. Or it didn't work out. Okay. Maybe don't do that again, but you can't be driving them nuts saying, all right, you are just out of control. (laughs) It's not good for the company. Um, it's not, it's not. So, all right, then we're kind of getting up the food chain here. Let's talk about the role of a vice president. I mean, really, what what is the day in the life of a vice president? Obviously, in your case, it's Zildjian, but I'm sure it's pretty similar across the board uh, with a lot of differences, obviously, too. But what does a vice president really do? Well, in my case, um, I, I had a, a three managers working for me and then and, and then people below them as well. And what I tried to do though, Bart, is I, I tried to still, and I think I did, I think I managed to do this, stay connected to the drummers. I mean, I, I wasn't doing all the day-to-day stuff that I used to do, obviously. Yeah. Um, but I still wanted to be accessible to, I, I keep saying these names, guys like Peter Erskine or Dennis or any of these people that would want to call me and speak with me, Charlie Watts or someone like yep. that, that, that um, with all due respect to the people that work for me, they, they didn't know these people. They, yeah. I was still their person and I didn't want them to ever feel that I'm a vice president now. So, you know, really I, 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 I sit around with the board of directors and discuss, you know, yeah. the future of the company. But, um, 
that job, what, what came with that job was more fiscal responsibility, just what we were talking about in terms of really having my eye on the budget all the time and making sure that we weren't, um, you know, we had, we had two satellite offices that worked for me, London and Los Angeles and people that worked in those offices and product that was going out the door to those offices and servicing drummers. Um, so there was always those types of things to maintain. Um, yeah. Lots of meetings because, you know, being involved with the marketing people and talking about advertising campaigns and um, being part of the sound team or the R&D team and, and being a voice uh, for artists on new product designs or, or maybe, maybe raising an issue that someone had brought to my attention with something that they weren't happy with mm -hmm. Or sometimes even me being out in the field in a music store and seeing some things that I felt needed attention. So, you know, those types of things, it's more of like at the 10,000 foot level than, than yeah. the ground level sometimes. No, that makes perfect sense. It's more of like uh, the people who would be at the upper level of their department need to go to you to get the approval to move forward in certain things. Uh, so, but someone like you to be in that position, it sounds like you have to have had such experience to know the right way to do things and to what to approve. And maybe you could say like, I wouldn't do that. I've tried some things like that and uh, that's not the way to go. And you actually mentioned another thing. So kind of going back a little bit, I, I, cause I mean, VP is pretty obviously a high position and, and none of these are lesser, but let's, let's talk about, R and D a little bit because that is such a cool um, thing. I mean, you're you're coming up with these awesome ideas and trying things. What does that department look like? Well, it's I I think it's a lot different than when I was still there. I know, um, you know, at that time, I think it was you know like Paul was sort of Paul Francis was was kind of really the 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 main person there that was doing the R and D and and we we worked closely with drummers um i might come to him and say i was talking to so-and-so and he had this idea or paul might come to me and say so-and-so uh, you know that i a drummer contacted him directly with an idea what you know what do you think um so you know i guess the the slippery slope that comes with that though bart is that there are a lot of ideas out there whether they be from drummers or within the company even. Yeah. And sometimes all those ideas don't turn out to be great ideas. Mm -hmm. And the key is, you know, you want to try to land on a great idea. You don't, um, you know, people can sometimes be a little unforgiving with the ideas that aren't such great ideas. Yeah. Um, luckily, most people remember the good ideas more <laughs> than the bad ones. But yeah. my point being that it's, you know, there was, there was like a, uh, almost like a, a filtration system of just, being able to sort of weed out certain things. Uh, if someone came to me with it, with this, you know, they say, I've had this idea for a symbol that um, can do all these different things. And it looks like this. And I'd say, well, you know, we make something that's about 98% of what you're saying. Yeah, I know, but I've tried that, but it's just that other, and you have to make a call maybe, and, and it wouldn't be my decision, but I, it, the, the call might be whether we pursue going that extra 2% and we just go, you know what? It, it, we're so close with what we have. Sure. We could make one for you, but to market this as a product, it's probably not going to sell because there's this other one that's already there. You yeah. Know? And, and in my mind, what I would always default to would Wes at Explorers. Is Wes going to carry this one that he's been selling for five years plus this new one that's almost just like it? Probably not. Too he's many gonna skews, go, you know? Yeah, exactly. He's going to say, well, man, you know, I this one's doing really well for me. I, I, I get what, what this one is, but I don't know that it's going to make a difference, you know? And yeah. that's kind of where knowing the business comes in. It becomes a very important part of what you do. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we all know this with the world of the internet. People are really critical and we'll just immediately say like, this is just, oh, this, I hate this idea. This is terrible. So you kind of need to yeah, run it through that filter of what's the armchair, you know, expert going to say of like, you know, immediately criticizing. And I think all, most brands really are good about kind of uh, not caring that much because the comment sections, usually you just stay out of, <laughs> but, yes, but you got to, yeah. you know, you don't want to 
I don't know. It's it's a different world now where it's people can be very very critical. Yeah, and and I think I I think the process at Zildjian has changed dramatically since I've left in terms of how they how they take a, an idea to an actual finished product. I think there's a more of a um, more of a, a lengthy process that it has to go through to to reach that point. I don't think it's it used to be a few of us would on the R and D team would be sitting in a room and say, yeah, let's give it a try. Let's, mm. let's try making uh, a new sheet bronze symbol that can do this, you know? And, um, you know, I, I don't think that happens anymore. I, I don't know. I can't speak for other companies and I, I probably shouldn't try to speak for Zildjian because it's, sure. yeah. I think it's changed a lot. Yeah. Since I've left. All right. So as we're getting kind of close to the end here, we, we should just kind of touch on being the president of one of these companies. What does that really look like? Is that being kind of the face of the company and the outward, you know, like this is I'm at the top? What, how does that work? That's a really good question. Um, when I started, Armin uh, Zildjian was still the president of the company. And uh, and, and that was great. I, I was fortunate to work there um, for 14. You know, Armin was still alive for 14 of the 24 years that I worked there. So mm. that was, a, I, I think back to that as yeah. being just, I was so fortunate to have that. But um you know, he, he was, um, when he was president, he was a presence, but he wasn't in the office every day. And I think he would be someone that, that would make a decision when, when there needed to be like a f- sort of final decision made, whether it's opening a new stick factory or, um, whatever the case may be. Uh, during my time when, when his daughter Craigie, uh, was president and I, I don't, I think she's now sort of, semi, I would say semi-retired, but there's another person, I think, running the company. Sure. But, um, but Craigie was, was very hands-on. She was very involved. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, I I really appreciated the relationship that her and I had for a long time in that, um, I could go directly to her. I mean, there was someone uh, between me and her in terms of, for the most part, uh, the chain of command, but, but she always made it clear that I could come directly to her and she would come directly to me and she would listen to my voice. She'd ask my opinion on things. Um, and I think a, a good president, again, stands at that or sits or whatever they do at the 10,000 foot level and they sort of move the pieces around yeah. like I would do with my team. They just do it at a, on a larger scale and, and let the people, you know, you, you hopefully have good people working for you in all these departments let them kind of do their thing. And if you need to come in and move something in a different direction, you do it, but you don't micromanage. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. it's yeah. not to say she didn't always, it's not to say she never micromanaged. <laughs> <laughs> Every Maybe I apologize. does. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah. I, I would, yeah, I would say it's her company. So she can, she's can do whatever she wants, but, um, but no, I, I think to, to answer your question and, and, you know, without, trying to be funny about it. It's, sure. I think that's, um, I, you know, you, you have to have a, as a president, you have to have a vision of what you want the company to be, where you want it to be in five years, how you want to get there. And then, you know, kind of pass that on to the people that are going to execute that, that plan for you, that strategy. Yeah. That's a perfect way to look at it. I think most people have worked for a company where the president of the company, I know I was doing out of, college after the photo stuff i was doing video for a company and the the president of this company would call me and talk to me about uh shooting this video for him and it was which was fine but he would he would be telling me about you know this gear that i shouldn't be using and i shouldn't do this and this lav mic that i bought was like four hundred dollars he's like you did you really need to buy that And i'm like what are you talking about (laughs) why are you calling me uh it's just crazy it wastes it's what do they say tripping over dollars to get to quarters or pennies or whatever yeah it's penny wise pound foolish exactly yeah. 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 yeah 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 many many sayings people have been there in our position to where there's now a lot of sayings for it but uh that's just fascinating so this has been a cool look at the drum industry but obviously as we kind of wrap up i want to talk about um what you, i mean you left zildjian in 2013 you've been staying very busy um more recently you've been doing the live from my drum room um just talk about that a little bit you have so many great guests who wow, clearly like you, so you. And you have background with people. It's just, it's very fun to watch. Well, th- thank you, Bart. Th- and thanks for the plug. So, I, you know, I think like a lot of people, I, I started doing it. It's coming up on two years now. I started in like March, I think, of 2020, March or April. Um, 
just being tired of being, you know, locked down yep. like all of us were at that yep. time. And, and I was seeing other people doing things like this on Facebook, like doing these Facebook live things. So I thought, well, you know, I've, I've kind of done some of these things before with Zildjian. I, I, I do a little fun video, uh, thing with Steve Gadd on tour and we'd have like a couple of laughs. So I had this idea of, of, you know, just not being too serious about it. I guess if, if, if that's the only way I can explain it is I kind of learned as I went along, I really didn't know what I was doing and I still don't really know what I'm doing. I see what you do and it's so much more professional and, it, and it's, <laughs> it's so much better. <laughs> oh my I'm God. Gonna, no, no. I'm going to learn from you. But, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I, I kind of, I knew that I could reach out to some friends and say, look, I've, I've got this, I not even an idea, but let's just go on the air. We're not going to have any kind of format. I'm not going to have any questions. We're just going to wing it. We're just going to talk. And the first two or three, um, I was just sort of getting the bugs out in terms of the, the technical side of it. And, but they went really well. And people, I think because they had nothing else to do, were tuning in like by the hundreds, we're watching these things live. And I hadn't even really started to put them on YouTube yet. I was just amassing these these recorded shows so to speak and then i started to get a little more serious about it and i thought well i'm going to i'm going to start a youtube channel and I, i'm going to figure out how i put these on youtube yeah. i didn't even know how to do that yeah um and it's only been since last summer that i started making them into podcasts and and i and you know this better than anybody bart but i've i've it's amazing how much that has just for me anyway that became such a huge thing like i if i load I'm doing a show this Saturday with Anton Fig, and I'll I'll probably have a couple of hundred people watch it on YouTube within a day or so. But I'll have that many downloads on on uh, on a podcast maybe within a few hours. Yeah, uh, it's and I think that that's that's a that's a testament to how many people prefer you know the ease of a podcast versus a YouTube video. Yeah, you can just listen the lawn to your car. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so much, and I, it took me a minute to you know to understand that I should have done that a long time ago, but I'm, but anyway, so I, I started to get a little bit more serious about it and, and, um, tried to clean up my act. And then I got more serious about getting guests and trying to make them fun to watch and interesting. And, and my whole concept throughout this whole time has simply been, don't make it feel like, or sound like everything this drummer or person has ever done before. Try to make it a little different, Sure. you know, and I, and I, I, I'm fortunate to know if I don't know them personally, I'm at least familiar enough with their work that I can get into some nitty gritty Yeah. that other people, I, I see some of these other ones and I don't want to be critical, but they're just so not yours. Honestly, yours are <laughs> fantastic, but, I, but I mean like some of them are just, it's just kind of the same kind of thing. And, uh, and yes, I agree. And, you know, and, and sometimes you can tell that the person interviewing doesn't even really know much about the person because they're asking very generic type things, but I want to like with Joe Vitale, who I've just been a, a huge fan of his for so many years. I, I just got into all this deep stuff about songs. Like, what were you thinking when you played this part? I had Kenny Jones, um, who I'd never, I've never met in person, but I had him on my Charlie Watts tribute show. And then we did our own, in, you know, standalone show. Uh, and I asked him about playing it on it's only rock and roll by the stones, the, yeah. the song. And he, talked about that. And, um, so, you know, it's things like that, that, that I sort of go for, and it's almost really my own, um, I'm, I'm in my own self-indulgence that I'm doing these, some of these for, you know? Yeah. But it's, it's a great way. I mean, people love them and, and, uh, and you've, I think you've done a great job and just even your room, it's just cool to be, we have the video up right now. People listening on the podcast can't see it, but it's like, it's like, I'm, I'm inside of live from my drum room. Cause you're, you're, <laughs> you're there and you're, you're set up and, <laughs> very, very put together. And, uh, it's a lot of work. I mean, all this stuff is a lot of work as you know. Um, but it, it pays off. And, uh, I mean, I, again, like I said before, I think people kind of take for granted that these things just all this content just appears, but it doesn't, it takes time to book people. It's, it's, I'm, I'm really glad you're doing it. I think there's, there's certain all, all drum content and podcasts and things are great, but it's, you're, you have the industry experience that I think no one else can really have, have your personal knowledge and experiences. Um, so it's, it's important. And and like I said before, I'll share it, um, in the description and, and honestly just type in live from my drum room and it'll pop up everywhere. Um, 
So well, thank I, you, Bart. Yeah. And I just want to say, you, I, I, I tip my hat to you because I think you're doing an incredible job and you're doing, you know, when you look at your, all the podcasts you've done over the last few years and I, you know, I, I commend you because you're, you're getting to talk to, you're talking to people that are so important to the industry that might not be high profile, but, but they've contributed so many guys like Rob Cook and, yep. and, um, you know, they're just huge, um, a part of this industry. And I, and I think that for me, I'm, I'm thinking the same way with some of the artists that I'm talking to and that, you know, I, I want something to be in the archives long after I'm gone about, um, you know, remembering Charlie Watts, exactly. talking about Ringo, um, drummers that don't get a lot of attention that, when people know their story, go, wow, he played on that record or he, you know, yeah. Gary Malibur, for example, who again, a, a childhood hero of mine played on all the big Steve Miller records. A lot of people don't know who Gary is, but he's like this unbelievably prolific recording drummer um, that I just, you know, I, for my own self indulgence, again, I wanted something, you know, saved forever that, that, yeah, you know, totally. Can celebrate Gary. You know? These will live forever. And thank you so much for your kind words. I appreciate it. I mean, it's I I wasn't really I was playing in bands and stuff, but now I've kind of slipped in the back door into the drum world uh, <laughs> by just do, <laughs> starting this. So um, it's been an absolute joy to do. And I get getting to talk to guys like you and, and meet people. Um, it's just what 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 better way is it? I'm sure you missed a little bit of having these connections with these artists. And now you get to do it again. Yeah, yeah, I, I did. And, I, you know, there were quite a few I, I had been in touch with anyway, sort of even when I was not working in the business anymore. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's nice to reach out to old friends and just go, hey, you know, we're, we're still, even if we're in touch on Facebook, it's just nice to, to go, hey, why don't you come on and, and, uh, yeah, you know, we'll chat about some things. So for sure. And that's a great transition. So, Speaking of old friends, um, John has been kind enough. He's going to, after we finish this episode, he's going to hang out and we're going to do a quick bonus episode. And we absolutely have to talk about the legendary late, great Charlie Watts, who you had, you really, really knew him and had a lot of great experiences with him. I see you're wearing the sympathy for the drummer shirt from our, our buddy, Mike Edison. Um, absolutely. Yeah, and my man, and just, and, and the stones and everything. And, and like people on the show know, I had that amazing experience getting to meet him and go on stage and you had that many times so um i want to just kind of pick your brain a little bit about that and talk about some of your experiences with charlie on that bonus episode which people can uh check out on patreon go to drumhistorypodcast.com and there's a little button there um but what a loss i mean i feel like just without giving too much away on the main one because we'll save it for the bonus but i i think about it. i mean i walk by a picture i have in my house of me and charlie and my and my wife and i think about him every day i'm sure you do too I do too. I have, I have a lot of, um, and if you can see that photo behind me, I have, you know, many, uh, constant reminders of Charlie in my house and, and, uh, you know, and in my, in my heart and soul, you know? Yeah. So John, thank you so much for taking the time to do this and share your immense knowledge. And, um, thank you for being here. This is just awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Bart. I had a great time and, and thank you again. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.